much, um, Chairman. Um, I'd like to begin by thanking the committee for having me here today to discuss the humanitarian impact on the conflict in Syria and, the, uh, and MSF's response. Um, I've just returned from Jordan in northern Iraq myself, where I was conducting an assessment uh, for MSF on the overall humanitarian response in the region for Syrian refugees. Uh, thousands continue to cross the border almost daily, and they're all actors are trying to scale up their activities in order to try and meet the increasing needs. Um, today I'll focus mostly on MSF's response inside uh, Syria itself, uh, but I'd be happy to address any questions that come regarding um, the response to Syrian refugees. So across Syria, there are enclaves surrounded by intense fighting where virtually no aid is reaching the people trapped inside. Our teams are on the ground have seen firsthand the horrors of living under siege where, for example, water is cut off and snipers fire at anyone who tries to access the only well with water left in the area, where food is scarce and the constant shelling is intense. People are living in extreme fear and in abominable conditions. It is the wounded and the sick who face near insurmountable obstacles when trying to access health care due to the relentless bombings and the targeting and destruction of Syria's health system. The medical system, like the rest of Syrian society, has been under siege during the conflict and is no longer capable of responding to the acute and chronic medical needs of the Syrian people. Of the 91 public hospitals across the country, 60% have been damaged or have been completely destroyed. Doctors have fled the country in huge numbers. Among those who remain are small numbers of medical specialists, doctors in training, and surgeons with little or no experience on operational war-related injuries. Dentists are performing minor surgeries, pharmacists are treating patients, and young people are volunteering to work as nurses. In Medicine Sans Frontieres, we're providing emergency surgical care to victims of violence and trauma in six hospitals across three governments in northern Syria. I'd like just to read out an extract written by one of our Irish doctors who has just returned from working for two months in our hospital in Idlib, which reflects the reality of the situation on the ground. And then August hit, and our project quickly turned to a trauma management. Fighting intensified, villages are bombed, and casualties, fighters and civilians flooded in. Within two weeks, we launched nine mass casualty incidents. This is when the influx of the wounded exceeds the capacity of our hospital. They all came together and with injuries so severe that many needed life-saving treatment at the exact same time. The inpatient wards swelled beyond capacity, yet we didn't have the staff to manage this. Many of the team just kept working later and later each day, pushing past their limits. There was no other choice. Even between these events, we were much busier than before with trauma victims. More skulls fractured open, more hands and feet blown off, more injuries bleeding inside chests and abdomens needing immediate intervention, more faces smashed in. Some cases were brought in already dead. Some were immediately palliative as our staff sat with the parents of children waiting for them to die peacefully. Others were the friends and family of our staff. Explaining to Thies, our translator, that there was nothing we could do to save his uncle who was hit by a rocket, he understood. Many of our family have already been killed. We know this is what happens. As a later bombing, at a later bombing of a local village, our new doctor lost three family members. He quickly moved his family the following day and then turned up for work again. And I couldn't say to him, take some days off, you need it. The line between staff and victim had long since been lost. Today, Syrians are not just dying only from bullets, bombs and missiles but also from easily treatable and preventable illnesses. These are the silent casualties. These are people with chronic conditions like cancer and diabetes. With the collapse of the health system, they can no longer get treatment. They cannot be referred outside the country, and so they are dying slowly. We're seeing evidence of hepatitis A and measles in children, children that have not been vaccinated in over two years. Though MSF initially focused on providing emergency and trauma care, we've now extended to include primary consultations, maternal care, polio and measles vaccination campaigns, mental health programmes and donations to treat communicable diseases such as typhoid, typhoid and chronic illnesses. We're working with 450 team members on the ground in order to deliver these essential medical services. 
In areas where we cannot send our own teams because of insecurity or lack of access, we have expanded our programme uh, for the last two years of supporting Syrian medical networks, hospitals and medical posts by providing drugs, medical equipment and technical advice. We are now supporting 84 health structures. The majority are in opposition-controlled areas, but some are in government-controlled areas or areas of conflict, um, of conflict that are under mixed control. In many areas, people are too scared to cross front lines to access health care, and health care workers have been killed, arrested, tortured or threatened. Medical structures are relentlessly bombed, and military bases have been established close to makeshift hospitals, putting these medical facilities at risk of being caught in the middle of fighting or directly hit in an attack. The situation is so extreme that some doctors have told us they feel it is more dangerous for them to be caught carrying medical supplies than if they are caught carrying weapons. Despite the challenges of medical supply throughout Syria, there is some level of capacity that is being sustained in government-controlled areas and an underground movement of medical facilities that operates in opposition areas. These structures are set up in incredible conditions, from kitchen tables to underground basements. However, this medical capacity is not provided outside the divides of conflict, and therefore both sides view health providers as targets. Field hospitals are almost systematically bombed, health workers in government hospitals are threatened not to go to work, and medical staff provide treatment to wounded in secret. One of the latest examples was in early September when a field hospital in Al-Bab, northern Syria, was bombed by the Syrian Air Force, killing nine patients and two medical staff. The challenges in responding to the humanitarian fallout of this brutal conflict are immense. There is an insufficient deployment of aid in Syria. For those providing access to cross borders, such as Medicines on Frontiers, it is impossible to have a huge geographic coverage. Aid is really confined to a small area close to the Turkish border and is possible to address only a fraction of the needs. Since the beginning of the year, fewer than 20 UN and ICRC convoys have managed to cross front lines. Only a large-scale cross-border supply operation can meet the needs resulting of the fighting, the widespread destruction, population displacement and the collapse of public services. What we are seeing today is that even the very limited deployment of aid is being squeezed and is un under constant threat. What we need is that we need to see more humanitarian actors accepted to work in Syria by the Syrian government. We need a complete lifting of restrictions on where medical aid can be deployed. And we need a respect for the safety of aid actors to be shown by both the armed opposition and the Syrian army. And to achieve this, we need to see a diplomatic mobilisation similar to that which we saw around the issue of chemical weapons. Thank you.